Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Liz Toth. I'm the Director of Alumni Relations, and I want to thank you all for joining us for today's webinar. We will have an opportunity for questions at the end. You'll see a box where you will be able to write in questions, and we will answer as many as possible towards the end of our webinar. And with that, I'm excited to turn this over to Professor John Henson, who is joining us today to talk about the science of COVID-19. Thank you, Professor Henson. Great, thanks to everybody for joining us. I'm actually standing in the rector at the moment because I'm gonna use the whiteboard and I also have it set up for a three o'clock forum talk tonight, which can be a little more involved. But uh, today we're just gonna to try to go over some very basic uh, biology and immunology uh, for about the virus and uh, a little bit about how it affects the body and then how, how the immune system responds to it. And we'll also talk a little bit about treatments and the vaccine efforts, and um, it's going to be kind of compressed. And I'm going to try to start things very simply and then um, share a few slides as we go along as well. So if we could just start with, you know, sort of the basic um, foundation of biology, which is this notion that we have these information molecules of DNA, which of course make RNA, which make protein and this is the way that cells are put together of course and we know that the information that flows from DNA to RNA is then reinterpreted as protein molecules this is the way our own cells work well of course many viruses tend to short circuit this particular information flow right so for example um, the virus that causes COVID-19 is SARS-CoV-2. And uh, as far as I can tell, is this reversed or is it? Liz, can you tell me, can you read that? Or? Yes, I can read it. Okay, great. Because uh, it's it's showing up mirrored for me, which is gonna be interesting. <laughs> um, so the, the virus that causes uh, COVID-19 is actually an RNA virus, interestingly enough. So it short circuits this whole process and essentially starts at the RNA level, right? It also has to, of course, make more of itself in the same way that your cells have to make more DNA. The SARS virus, uh, COVID-2 virus, has to make more of its RNA. Um, there are other examples of other viruses that do interesting things with the information flow you might know for example hiv the virus that causes aids actually uh, comes in as, in as an rna virus but actually then reverts to dna and then goes through the process this way so viruses are very clever uh, evolution has fashioned them in ways that they take advantage of this information flow um, so cars cov2 is actually an rna what's called a positive strand rna virus so how does it work in terms of actually infecting our cells? I'm going to share the screen here. Um, so let's see. I don't know if you can see that, the slide, or can you see that, Liz? Or? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so what we're looking at here is actually the virus itself, and it's very simple. It's actually a structure that has this sort of membrane around it in purple. It's got the RNA inside of it that's complex to proteins. And then the protein that everyone seems to be interested in is the proteins that stick out of the membrane of the virus, these green proteins here, which are called spikes. If you look at it in an electron microscope, this is what it looks like. Those spikes are very prominent, which gave the name corona to these viruses because they look like a crown or they look like the corona of the sun. And actually, already, the actual three-dimensional structure of this protein is known. Uh, this is what you're showing here. And then over here, we're seeing a model of this protein interacting with the cell uh, that it's going to affect. And that's the, the business end of the virus. In other words, every virus has to have a protein or something on the cell that it interacts with. And in this case, that something on the surface of the cell is a receptor called ACE2. And ACE2 is a protein that's actually involved, interestingly enough, in blood pressure regulation. Uh, it's uh, angiotensin converting enzyme 2, which is involved in a complex physiological process for how blood pressure is 
is regulated in the body. Uh, and so many cells actually have that on their surface. Uh, they tend to be cells that you find in places like the respiratory tract, the digestive tract, blood vessels, in the kidney. Um, so there's a lot of cells in your body that have ACE2 on their surface and are potentially vulnerable then, therefore, for the virus to bind to. Um, it turns out that if you could look at sort of a, a pathway by which the virus goes inside cells, you notice that over here, it's binding to the ACE2 we talked about. There's another protein that's found there that actually also is important. Um, and that protein essentially works on the virus. It's, on, it's, it's um, present on cells and it works on the virus to help it get inside the cell. So without the combination of both of those proteins, those cells are probably not too vulnerable. So the recent work, a paper that just came out actually yesterday, suggests that uh, ACE2 and this other protein are indeed present on a number of cells as well. And therefore, there's probably a number of cells that are vulnerable to viral infection. We know the respiratory tract, of course, but in the digestive tract, um, and in blood vessels, for example. Notice that once the virus gets inside the cell, it has to sort of break out of this sac of membrane that it's in, and it does that uh, and releases its RNA, and that RNA has to both replicate and make more viral proteins, and then those proteins are packaged back up in membrane, the RNA is incorporated, and therefore the virus then leaves the cell. And this, these viruses tend to replicate relatively quickly. Um, and that's one of the reasons that they get a head start essentially on your immune system response to it, which makes it difficult for the body to sort of catch up. Um, and notice that the, the RNA of this virus is immediately available to make more protein for the virus and to replicate itself, which is another reason it's relatively quick in replicating and making more. And then once it makes more of itself, it goes on and of course infects other cells. So where does it land first? Well, again, a paper that was just published a couple of days ago suggests that these two receptors for the virus, if we call them the ACE2 receptor and this other protein, TMPRS, is actually both present on cells that line your nasal cavity, not surprisingly. Um, and these cells are pictured here, interestingly enough. So the outside world, the air you're breathing is out here. Uh, this is the so-called epithelial layer where the cells are. And these cells consist of cells that are secreting things like mucus onto the surface and cells that have hairs on the surface, which are constantly move, moving this mucus layer to try to get rid of things like bacteria and viruses and dust and the like. Unfortunately, these cells uh, have a lot of those two proteins on their surface. So they seem like they're ideal candidates for the virus to infect initially. And because they're not very deep in your respiratory tract, virus that's emitted there also goes back out, you know, when you sneeze and uh, cough and things like that, which means that this virus is going to be easily transmissible, right? Highly contagious, which we know it is. It's very contagious. Um, other viruses that of this corona type you may have heard of, like MERS, are actually viruses that tend to infect cells very deep in the lungs, and therefore they're less likely to be infectious. So SARS-CoV-2 virus actually infects these cells, but it also has the ability to go deeper into the lungs. And so I thought we should look at what's going on in the lungs. And I don't know if this is going to work, but we'll try it. Is the screen still visible, Liz, as the slides? Yes, looks great. Okay, great. So here are the lungs, and one way to think of them is the air passage is going down deeper and deeper into the lungs. You can sort of think of it eventually as a bunch of grapes. In other words, the grapes coming off that or those branches are actually the air sacs, of course, where gas exchange takes place. And those grapes, uh, are, of course, are surrounded by blood vessels because the the purpose of the lungs is to exchange gas, right? You want to exchange your CO2 from your red blood cells for oxygen. And you want to have a, you know, an anatomy in order to do that. And of course, you have to create this air sac where you can have a very close opposition between the blood and the airspace. Um, 
And the way that works is that if you could look inside the lungs with just looking with a microscope, you would see that the walls, and these are what the walls of these air sacs look like, are very, very thin. They only consist of a few cells. And in fact, there's a cell that makes up the lining of the air sac, and then there's a cell that makes up the lining of the blood vessels. And those are all packaged together in very, very narrow walls, as you can see. And the reason for that, of course, is to try to make a very narrow space that air will have to move. So in this narrow wall here, air just moves in from the airspace through the, the actual lining of the lung, through the lining of the blood vessel, and into the red blood cell. And your lung, usually, if you look at it in the microscope at low magnification, you just see blank space because most of it is airspace, right? Which is good because that's what you need. You need to have these full air sacs in order to exchange gas, get oxygen in the body, and of course, distribute that to, to everywhere else. Um, it's actually even more obvious if you look in the electron microscope and what we're looking at now, these little structures you see here are red blood cells. They're going through a capillary in the wall of the alveolus. And sure enough, here's the airspace over here. Here's the lining of the lung. There's the lining of the blood vessels. So it's a tiny, thin, thin space. Um, and sure enough, uh, SARS-CoV-2, the virus can actually get down deep into these lungs. And it turns out that one of the cells that expresses both the proteins that it likes is this big cell called the type 2 alveolar cell, which is a cell that's really important for how the air sacs work. It tends to secrete a detergent-like molecule that keeps these air sacs open because it lowers water tension, uh, water surface tension in those air sacs. And so it's probably a bad thing to be infected uh, by that virus. <clears throat> so this is just more EMs of that. So, so then the question is, well, what happens, you know, in the pathology of the lung if you have an infection with the respiratory virus? Um, what happens to those thin, fragile walls that are absolutely essential for oxygen exchange to take place? This slide tries to show that. And so in the healthy lung, that you see up here, you can see the thin walls of the air sacs, and they're very thin. There's a lot of air space, as you can see. But in a, this is actually a clinical um, manifestation that's very similar to what happens with COVID-19. It's called ARDS, or Acute Respiratory Dis Distress Syndrome, which a lot of COVID-19 patients go into. What happens there is you can tell now the lung, which is, it looks not anything like we saw in the healthy condition. It's all those walls are highly thickened and they're thickened to the point where the air exchange can't take place well. And the reason they're thickened is because there's fluid leaking out of the blood vessels. There's cells that are leaving the blood vessels. There are cells that are actually migrating into the tissue space and even into the air space. Um, and you can see that over here and over here as well. Sometimes it get very severe as you see over here. Um, let's go back this way. All right, so, so once that happens, you can't exchange oxygen very well, of course, and you have shortness of breath, obviously. And at that point, you have to have external oxygen to actually try to increase the oxygen levels in your lungs. And if it gets quite bad, then you have to have assisted ventilation, right? And you're put on a ventilator to, again, try to help you breathe uh, with excess oxygen. Um, beyond that point, the, the, the last essentially clinical uh, intervention is this machine called ECMO, which is a machine that essentially does out of the body oxygenization and then puts newly oxygenated blood back in the patient. But that's really reserved typically for very, very ill patients who have some level of, of um, ability to survive, uh, as, as many of you know, when you're put on a ventilator, the probability of coming off of it is, um, is relatively low. In other words, in the most recent uh, New York uh, public health analysis of patients on ventilators in New York City is only about 40% uh, came off the ventilators um, over time. So if you can't exchange ga gases in your lungs because of this viral infection, that's a that's a real problem. So, uh, oops, the lights are going. Maybe that was good. 
Don't worry. This happens all the time. Um, so, so you say, well, what do we, what can we do? What, what kinds of um, treatments can we possibly do to uh, stop this from happening, right? So I'm going to go back to this slide that showed us about the virus. Well, of course, a lot of folks are focused on these drug treatments. And one drug treatment you could imagine, why don't we just try to block the receptor proteins in some way, right? And it turns out we already have drugs that can block these receptor proteins because some of these drugs are involved, of course, with things like blood pressure regulation, where we actually have drugs that can block this particular protein too. So a lot of trials are being done now around using these kinds of drugs. Um, another thing you would say, well, I know that our cells don't typically replicate RNA, right? Our cells uh, do DNA replication and make RNA. We don't do this strange RNA replication that viruses do. Uh, and so this must be a this must be a point at which the virus is vulnerable. In other words, isn't the virus going to be vulnerable to drug treatment there? And you're right, there's a lot of drugs now focused on this step where the virus is replicating its RNA. And the drug you've probably heard about is remdesivir, which is one of these kinds of drugs. But there's many of them that are trying to inhibit the ability of the virus to replicate. So there's actually a number of um, drugs that are being focused here. And remember, there's a lot of drug companies that are doing very sophisticated combinatorial chemistry to look at all kinds of ways to interfere with how the virus works. And we're in the midst of hundreds of clinical trials going on right now in many therapeutics with, with, these, uh, with these drugs. So far, as you're probably aware, a lot of the, a lot of the information is not clear, um, but there's been, there are a lot of efforts to try to make that clear as we go along, we'll see. Okay. So what about the pathology of uh, COVID-19 in particular, if we could look at the lungs? What we're looking at now is actually a CAT scan, axial section of the lungs. On the top row is healthy individual. What you see here is actually the heart, and then these are the lungs here. And as again, just like when you're looking in the microscope, we expect mostly blank space. When you're looking in a, um, in a radiological way, you would expect to just see blank space as well, because if it's mostly air there, that would you would expect. And that's what you see in the healthy lung. There's a lot of air space, which is great. But if you go down to this COVID-19 lung, um, you notice that there are all these sort of cloudy regions, particularly out at the periphery of the lungs themselves. These cloudy regions are indicative of some of that pathology in the lung we saw earlier, where there's infiltrates of fluid in cells that are now blocking these air spaces, and this is causing problems with gas exchange in this particular lung, and this can, can get worse over time, of course. This is actually a three-dimensional reconstruction of that particular lung um, showing these uh, showing these spaces in the lungs that were actually uh, clogged up by fluid infiltrates from the virus. Um, on the left uh, is the healthy lung, of course. Um, so this is what has been causing a lot of morbidity and mortality in patients with COVID-19. Um, it turns out that that's not the only thing, though. Many of you know that um, folks who have this disease have problems with blood clotting, with their kidneys, uh, with their heart. And part of that is probably due to the virus, because uh, it's been known that the virus can, seems to be able to infect kidney cells. Uh, it's possibly partially due with your immune system response to the virus. Uh, so your immune system response to this virus sometimes inappropriately. So by fighting off the virus, sometimes it's releasing so many inflammatory uh, substances that your body is actually causing uh, things that are as bad as what the virus is doing. So for example, inflammatory processes can easily lead to problems with clotting misregulation, with, with problems with loss of fluid from the blood that leads to hemorrhagic shock, all kinds of things that are problematic combined with what the virus is doing as well. 
Um, and speaking of the immune system, uh, uh, many of you have heard of, everyone seems to be talking about antibodies, um, antibodies being proteins that your immune system makes that would be against the virus, right? And you may ask the question, well, where do these antibodies come from? And it turns out that um, they come from a cell uh, in your body called a B cell. And the, and the interesting thing about this is that the antibodies you have against uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, you already have them. This is, this is very hard to believe, but because <laughs> it turns out that this antibodies that are on the surface of your B cells are all generated through a random reassortment of DNA that happens as you're a, as you're a fetus. And sure enough, you're born with all these different, probably tens of millions of difference of antibodies sitting on the surface of your B cells, some of which will actually react to um, SARS-CoV-2. And so once SARS-CoV-2 comes into your body, you already have these cells that can recognize it, interestingly enough. And then those cells have to be upregulated, they divide, make more of themselves, and then they start making these antibodies. And this is the antibodies are the thing that everyone is trying to test for to see if there's folks that have been exposed to the virus. And there's a lot of debate about whether these antibodies actually confer immunity to the individuals who are convalescent from the virus. I think that every infectious disease person that I know um, would argue that there's got to be some protective immunity from, from these antibodies. And part of that is just because once you get exposed to the virus, the B cells will be around, the memory B cells. There's also another group of immune cells called T cells that are important in this process too because they kill off virus. Um, they'll be around too. And so your second response to the, to the virus that causes COVID-19 would actually be better in terms of your immune response. So, so um, my sense, I think everybody, I know on immunology would agree with this, is that typically you would have a better immune response the second time around. So I think antibody testing actually is important, even if it's not as accurate as other kinds of testing. So we'll, we'll end here on the testing. So, so testing for antibodies, of course, is looking for someone who's been exposed to the virus and generating these antibodies. Testing for the virus itself involves looking for the RNA of the virus. We know the virus just has RNA. It just has a specific sequence of RNA. So it's actually relatively easy to devise tests that look for that sequence of RNA. Unfortunately, they're relatively complicated because they require you to amplify that RNA. You have to have a particular machine. You have to have a particular way to isolate. Um, you have to take the samples from deep in the nasal cavity. They have to be exposed to particular chemicals and reagents and, and enzymes. So that's one of the reasons the testing has been so slow because it's a complicated uh, test process to actually look at active infection with the virus, whereas antibody testing much easier uh, to do. So, um, great. Uh, in terms of vaccines, those of you maybe who are uh, a little bit older might, rec might uh, remember the, the, the most excitement about vaccines probably in the U.S. was generated by the polio vaccine uh, back in the 1950s and 60s. And at that time, it was a sort of a race between Jonas Salk and Albert Sabin to develop this vaccine. And they actually use strategies that, that companies and uh, research entities are using now with the vaccine against uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, Salk actually killed poliovirus and used that as a way to uh, immunize folks. And Albert Sabin generated a, a, a weakened form of the poliovirus that he used to, uh, to actually immunize people. And they both have their pluses and minuses. And right now, there's a whole bunch of vaccine efforts also based on things like killed viruses, portions of the virus, um, other viruses that have been engineered to express the spike protein from SARS-CoV-2. Um, so the, every kind of strategy, there's new strategies involving messenger RNA for the spike protein, DNA that encodes for the protein. So all those kinds of things are going on. And some of them are entering clinical trials very, very quickly. So let's, we can hope about that. All right, I think I'm going to stop sharing the screen. Go back to, and stop and take some questions because I'm already over time here. Let's see. 
Thank you so much, John. Uh, our first question is, if someone is asymptomatic, does that mean they have the immunity from the antibodies already? Um, not necessarily, because um, it depends on the time frame of infection, right? The, the one of the processes that happens uh, when you're infected with a virus, there are particular immediate things that happen, but those immediate things are not don't involve antibodies. They actually involve um, other processes that are actually helpful in terms of an immediate response to a viral infection. So, for example, cells release proteins called interferons that try to interfere with the virus, and they do things like they interfere with viral RNA replication. They um, tend to interfere with protein synthesis so the virus can't make more of itself. Uh, those are things that are immediately released by cells that are infected by the virus. And then there's other cells, uh, interestingly named, called natural killer cells. They go around and look for viral infected cells and they're, they don't need any specific thing. They just look for the virus and they can kill them too. The antibodies, the B cells response, doesn't come till several days later, right? So that someone who's asymptomatic has the virus um, wouldn't necessarily have antibodies. Um, however, if they're asymptomatic and had the virus and was stimulated sufficiently to go down the B cell route, they should have antibodies later. Um, but that would be my uh, conjecture about it for sure. Other questions? Yes. What are your thoughts on a probability of a second wave in the US? Uh, I think it's highly probable. Um, and the reason for that, of course, is um, the virus is not going away. Um, no one has. Well, as far as we can tell, no one has native immunity to it, and it's very easily transmissible. Um, there was some suggestion that, you know, the SARS virus, uh, the original coronavirus back in 2003, sort of uh, went away, uh, mostly because it's not as easily transmissible as SARS-CoV-2. And, and because of that, uh, as restrictions are eased, you know, folks, maybe there's even 20% of the population in New York City has the, has had the virus. It's still not a lot, right? Um, you don't get to this population-based immunity level till maybe 50 or 60%. So, however, if we're really, really clever about testing and tracing, we should be able to blunt those those um, increases in the fall and winter. Why? Well, if we can provide really widespread testing, we should be able to tell when people are infected, we should be able to isolate them, uh, we should be able to trace their contents. It's going to require a lot of public health effort, um, but it's possible. And if the, the alternative, if testing and tracing is one alternative, the other alternative is continuing to strangle our economy. <laughs> and obviously, I think we need to go down the road of testing and tracing. Yeah, other questions? Next question. Uh, do you agree that it will be likely a year to a year and a half before we get a successful vaccine? I don't know about that. And the reason I say I don't know about that is because there are actually, a, there's a vaccine candidate out of Oxford University, the Jenner Institute there, that is a chimpanzee adenovirus that has been engineered to uh, display the spike protein from SARS-CoV-2. And the reason it's kind of hopeful is because that that particular vaccine strategy has been used a lot by that particular institute. They already have gone to safety tests on it. They were trying it on MERS and on uh, the first SARS. And so they, they are already going into large scale clinical trials starting this week in 1,000 patients. And they plan to go to 5,000 patients next month. 5,000 patients in a, in a phase two clinical trial, meaning a trial for efficacy. So they're actually going to go somewhere, they don't know where yet, in the world that has an active COVID-19 outbreak and vaccinate 5,000 people, um, some with placebo, some, of course, with the, the vaccine. So, so they, are going, they are really moving rapidly towards um, efficacy trials. And other vaccine trials, even UPMC actually has its own vaccine, interestingly enough, which also is based on proven technology. I'm a little more pessimistic about uh, other vaccine trials that are based on 
messenger RNA or DNA technology because they're less proven. They're not as um, easy, I don't think, for us to manufacture and things like that. The other thing about some of these vaccines, they already have a manufacturing base. So I, I you know, I'm hopeful that we'll have a vaccine uh, by, you know, maybe early 2021. Who knows? And John, maybe we're talking, I think we'll have a therapeutic before then, quite frankly. I think we'll have a therapeutic. John, we're talking great time, but I I know you yeah. said we could likely go over a little bit if that's okay with sure. you. So there are a lot, of, a lot of questions left. I'd love to get to yeah. a few more. The other thing I'll say is that remember that this is a rapidly evolving situation where a lot of people are learning along the way. So already critical care uh, medical folks are, are learning that putting COVID-19 patients directly on ventilators with low you know, oxygen saturation levels doesn't seem to be as helpful as it would be in other instances. Um, it's actually better to try to keep them off the ventilators um, and breathing on their own as much as possible. So there's a lot of critical care um, medical knowledge that's being built about this disease. Uh, there's also, uh, let's face it, there's been no biomedical effort in, in, the, in the last 100 years, I would say, that has matched this. Uh, there are every biomedical laboratory that has any uh, opportunity to work on this disease is working on it. And um, the amount of power that's being brought to it is pretty extraordinary. Just the fact that there's already vaccines and clinical trials is just astonishing. This is this never happened before. And so my sense is that um, we'll have some kind of reasonable therapies, uh, certainly in six months, I would think. Um, but we'll, we'll see. Our next Other question. question? Yeah. Yes. Perhaps 20% of the U.S. may be on an ACE inhibitor for blood pressure, and I've heard there are some early studies on using these drugs as virus blockers. Have you seen or heard any results from this early epidemiology? Yeah, no, you're right. I, I myself take lisinopril, so I have a vested interest in uh, ACE inhibitors. Um, yeah, so the it's interesting. The jury is out on that because, of course, there's been some papers that suggest that uh, ACE inhibitors might indeed um, be protective and block the, uh, the virus. And there's other um, papers that would suggest that ACE inhibitors increase the expression of the ACE2 receptor on cells, which you would, would imagine would make cells more vulnerable to the virus. So there's, uh, there's sort of back and forth about that particular question. Right now, all of the, the major medical uh, organizations and cardiology societies uh, are all recommending that patients remain on ACE inhibitors because um, there's just no direct uh, information about what the virus is. Now, I will say that comorbidities are, are the biggest thing about this virus. The, the JAMA paper that came out from you know New York City with 5,000 patients in it uh, almost 90% of those patients had comorbidity of some type, whether it was hypertension, diabetes, obesity, um, and some 80% had more than one. And so comorbidities, um, they seem to be the, the thing that are causing patients with SARS-CoV-2 to actually have serious illness, um, and particularly multiple comorbidities. Uh, and, and, and that's... Um, that's unfortunate because, of course, in the United States, the general health of our population um, is not terrific, uh, and that's because of a lot of comorbidity, um, and particularly in select groups, uh, um, select minoritized groups that have had problem with access to health and access to healthy environments, and it's a, it's a tragedy. Um, so, anyway. How contagious are asymptomatic people versus symptomatic people? Yeah, I wish we could. I wish we knew that. Um, there's no question that uh, asympt asymptomatic people are actually can shed virus, and so then the question is, are they doing it differently than symptomatic people? I think that that study. I haven't seen any study like that. Um, you know, and I've skimmed many, many of the hundreds of studies here over the last couple of months, but I, I haven't seen something like that. And you may have seen that. There have been some studies that tend to suggest that this virus is 
maybe even better than an aerosol um, transmission virus because you know the aerosol transmission viruses you think go maybe six or seven feet but there's been some studies that suggest it could actually go much farther than that once it gets on air current so it's almost uh, almost getting to the point of an aerosolized virus which is something like a measles virus which can which is much more contagious of course so so my sense is that if you're in a closed space with uh, near to individuals um even if they're just talking to you, not sneezing or coughing or anything, the virus will be around, um, which is another reason to wear a mask. And that's because when you're talking, you're releasing all this, you know, these aerosols, of course. And if you have the virus, you're asymptomatic, you're wearing a mask, it's much better than if you're not. Well, that was actually our next question. Can you comment about face masks and if they're a false sense of protection and will cloth masks help? So it sounds like... Yeah, yes. <laughs> wear one. That's my, that's my recommendation to wear one. Interesting enough, uh, uh, I remember uh, communicating with a coronavirus expert back in January who was uh, who had been involved in some of the original wow. SARS work and and said that right then, and this was like a, a just as uh, as the Wuhan outbreak was happening, he said right then, wear a mask. <laughs> uh, Wear, wear gloves, it, it, although hand wash and sanitize is probably just as good. Um, don't touch services. I mean, he went through a whole list of these things, which at the time, even, you know, for me, I thought this seemed way over the top. But if I go back to that email, I, I say to myself, he was right about every one of those <laughs> precautions. Um, because having worked on, he's worked on coronavirus in the past, he knows that they're transmissible. He had actually worked on some of the viruses that cause common cold too which is very transmissible right we all know how transmissible the common cold is and, and many of those are coronaviruses that cause it so so you have to be super vigilant about it and wearing masks yeah you no know, it makes makes a lot of sense what other parts of the body have those proteins that could allow the virus to enter ears so, eyes etc yeah there's there's good evidence that the conjunctiva of the eye have it and um I know there's been um, medical evidence of conjunctivitis, you know, pink eye and, and some COVID-19 patients. And so, you know, even if you have a mask on, you shouldn't be rubbing your eyes, that's for sure. Um, there's also the same combination of proteins in the digestive tract, particularly in the lower intestine, the colon area. This is, again, correlates to medical symptomology of COVID-19 patients that have digestive issues, uh, faster, you know, intestinal issues. Um, there's good, at least morphological evidence uh, of viral infection in, in cells in the kidney. Uh, so there are a lot of cells in the body that potentially could, could actually uh, be infected with, uh, with the virus. And of course, there's been, uh, there's been a lot of um, recent publicity about patients with COVID-19 who have respiratory symptoms also having to go on dialysis because they have kidney problems. Um, some of that problem may be caused by the virus. Some of it's probably caused by uh, hyperinflammation from cytokine release syndrome, you know, in other words, the immune system. But uh, it's, uh, like I said, there's been some paper published that shows virus um, in kidney cells, actually, in protocytes of the, the marrows of the kidney cell. Anyway. How does the clinical trial for a vaccine work? Do you deliberately expose people to the virus to see if the vaccine works? Yeah, let's hope not. Uh, although they did that, um, uh, interestingly enough, in some, in some vaccine trials, they've done that. This is in the past, of course. Um, now the, you know, the vaccine manufacturers and the, and the research entities that are leading the vaccine trials, of course, what they are interested in, in using are areas where there's an outbreak of the virus in which um, they can take advantage of that outbreak, which seems to be a sort of counterintuitive. And in fact, the guy who's leading the Oxford study was saying that he's probably the only one in the world that's trying to, to hope that there's some place that actually still has active viral infection by the time their vaccine is ready for their big trials. Um, so yeah, they have to have a, a place where they can actually do it and show convincingly some benefit. 
So they have to have an area where there's community spread of the virus. Um, and of course, if you're a lockdown social distancing, you could argue that that may not happen. So it's an interesting, um, it's an interesting conundrum. But suffice it to say, it's probably likely that somewhere in the world they'll find uh, the right opportunity to do that. Um, we'll see. Uh, next question. If I understood correctly, if someone gets the virus a second time, the person's immune system would not be compromised so that they would have more difficulty recovering. One would suspect that is the case, um, that they would actually have a better immune response to the virus the second time. And the reason I say that is these cells that are involved in um, doing the adaptive response, and then namely B cells that make antibodies and T cells that help regulate the immune response in general. Um, when they have the first exposure, they actually make more of themselves. And some subset of those population of cells actually become so-called memory cells that hang around. Um, and those memory cells actually kick in once the second time you get exposed to the virus. So, so instead of having a lag between the time the virus comes and you get antibodies or you get good T cell killing of viral infected cells, that actually happens much quicker. Um, and memory cells, uh, there's still a lot of debate in the immunology community about their lifespan, but there's good evidence that they last uh, many, many years. Um, so, and you say, well, wait a minute, what, what about like the flu vaccine? Don't, don't we have to get a new vaccine every year? And, and the reason we have to do that is not necessarily because of your immune system uh, memory cells running out. It's because of course the influenza virus is highly mutagenic and, uh, and mutates a lot so that the, major proteins that we generate our antibody, our vaccines against are actually um, have changes in them and, and your immune system doesn't recognize them. So it's the virus that's changing. So far, the SARS-CoV-2 virus doesn't seem to be changing that much, which is a good thing. We'll see. Is there a biological explanation as to why a 75-year-old may get COVID and survive, while a healthy 35-year-old might get stricken and die in a matter of hours or days? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, it would be a hard thing to say why, why that would be. There are several um, groups now looking for genetic predispositions to uh, serious illness from COVID-19. Um, and I know there's been a uh, a big effort to look at um, genome sequencing of patients who have serious complications who don't have any other, let's say, um, predisposing comorbidity, right? Um, often, if you look at those cases of young individuals who are dying of the virus, you look at uh, clinical case studies of this, almost always you find some kind of comorbidity of some type. Um, but in some cases, there hasn't been any. And so the question is what, maybe there's a genetic predisposition to some of these things. It might be a very subtle immunosuppression that is in these, in these individuals that is, uh, again, not obvious in, unless they are under the assault of a, you know, of a very uh, virulent virus. So that's a possibility. Some folks have undiagnosed, you know, are undiagnosed in terms of being immunocompromised. So. Why is it recommended not to take ibuprofen versus acetaminophen in regards to COVID-19? Uh, yeah, there was some suggestion that um, ibuprofen was going to be lowering inflammation too much. And of course, you want to have uh, some level of inflammation taking place because that's going to be killing off viral infected cells, right? Um, so there was a worry that, you know, ibuprofen was going to be lowering uh, the levels of inflammation to a point you might you might be compromised your ability to fight off the virus. Of course, there was the counter argument that well, sometimes too much inflammation is bad. So why don't we go, why don't we go ahead and continue to, you know, you know, to take ibuprofen? But it turns out that that you know organizations that put out that recommendation have now retracted that. So acetaminophen is probably good. I mean, aspirin, interestingly enough, might have some advantages too uh, because of the impact on, um, you know, blood clotting. Oops, the lights went out again. But I would 
I guess the acetaminophen is probably the way to go. All right, we have one last question. Oh, excellent. Um, there have been reports of people recovering and the second time it can be fatal. Do you know what the reasons may be for this? Recovering the second time. Yeah, so these are people, they, they, uh, there's the conjecture that they were reinfected and then died, I suppose, according to that question. Um, there's certainly been a disease course in a number of patients where uh, patients will have the, uh, you know, symptomology for a week or 10 days, and they seem to be getting better, and then they become suddenly work, worse and die. Um, those patients, uh, at least from what I've seen of the medical case studies of that, are not patients that have been reinfected necessarily. They're just patients that have had a clinical course where they improved and then actually uh, went downhill suddenly. And part of that is just the way that they are responding to the virus, and then immune system is catching up with it, and then the virus actually overtakes it again, um, and then they rapidly go downhill uh, because they're not able to, again, keep up with the virus. So, so it seems like that course, uh, clinical course, is, is something that uh, bodes poorly for patients when they have a longer course of symptomology and they're slightly better and then rapidly downhill. Um, least what I've seen. But again, we're we're learning a lot about this virus. We know, let's face it, we don't know a lot about it, although we know a remarkable amount considering how new it is, but we still don't know a lot about a lot of things about it. So. All right. Well, with that, I just want to thank everyone again very much for coming and to thank Professor Henson uh, for joining us today. And as we you know, continue to learn more and more about this virus and as things change, appreciate you taking the time to help explain some of the science behind what the world is dealing with right now. So thank you very much for your, your thoughtful conversation. Great. Stay well, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye.